everybody, welcome to the 12 Oi Bit Nerd Church Podcast. I'm Jamin. I am the Tylar. And uh, we are about to talk about <clears throat> aliens. I don't have my hair quite uh, out of control enough to mean this, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, we, it was, it's actually a topic going on. We talked about it on the air environment from like a scientific conversation the other day. I was glad that Aaron was willing to entertain the conversation. I've actually <laughs> written a book called Alien Theology before. Uh, Monday and Wednesday of next week, the Jackson Cloud will be kind of talking about it. Monday, we'll talk about like from a philosophical, theological, scientific perspective, would God make aliens? And then Wednesday, we're actually talking about spiritual overtones with alien themes when we currently look into things like UFO cults. And if you know, if that all sounds like insanity to you, you'll be intrigued to see where those conversations go, I think. Um, yeah. And likewise, the option that I, I've been giving on all these podcasts, if you'd like a free PDF or free audio book of my book, Alien Theology, we'll give it to you. Just hop on the Nerd Church Discord, ask for a code, or... If you're watching us podcast this live on Facebook, just in the comments below, ask for that code and we'll get it to you as well. Um, but we're going to take this a different direction and more just talk about our favorite alien themes and entertainment, whether it's video games or TV or movies and why and what pops out to us. So, Because that's what Nerd yeah. Church does. We got the pop cult side going here. So so I'll, I'll go ahead and start with my favorite aliens in, uh, in culture and just, just to just start it off. Uh, so my favorite overall alien in culture is, uh, you want to guess my favorite alien, Jamin? I want you to guess. I was just going to say, I don't know. I'm trying to decide if you're going to go like a scary route or a funny route. I can't tell with you. Aliens? <laughs> <laughs> the Aliens movie? Uh, Probably not. Nope. I think that one's someone else I know is really into those ones. Superman. So, oh, okay. so, all right. Yeah. So, yep. That's the fun part is whenever people are like, Aliens, such a dumb theme. It's like, you ever watch a Marvel or DC movie and realize right? how much that is like the... That was actually a joke in the new Winter Soldier Disney Plus release I just put out. Like, it's yeah. always... Aliens, androids, or wizards that we're wizards. up against. Because <laughs> Thanos, even Thanos, like the big workup to like the final bad guy after like a decade of these these movies was just an alien. <laughs> yeah, alien you know? invasion. That's the that's yeah. the whole story. Yeah. So my favorite uh, alien is any kind of comic book aliens good, but Superman was my favorite, my first uh, alien kind of introduction uh to like the idea of beings from other planets coming to this one i think a lot of people lose track that like superman's an alien but like uh yeah they all are but i would say that like if we're going like horror aliens um i would actually say that predator would be my favorite horror horror alien more like thriller i, I always thought it was really fun also kind of funny the original movie um, was great. So I always loved the Predators. I thought the idea of them really fit like a fantasy world really well. So like if I was going to create this like alien race and like D&D &D or something that comes in, like what would I want them to do? Well, I think a, a Predator would be a super fun thing to have to try to fight. So um, it just let my imagination kind of go crazy when I watched uh, the Predator movies. Um, and then Alien versus Predator uh, <laughs> was a great, great movie series for its own reasons. Um, I actually know like almost nothing about Predator other than the skin in Fortnite creeps me out. <laughs> and I think I, I think I saw like the most recent Predator movie and that's the only one I've seen. Like the one that came oh. out a few years ago. That was bad. Um, they always just look so weird to me. Like, <laughs> like yeah. there's there's Alien, which is like scary Alien, but like weird and like a freak me out kind of way. But then there's Predator, which just like I'm like, this is what we've designed our main character. Like, <laughs> well, he's not supposed to be the main character, right? The main character, like, I don't know. I haven't series. seen it. <laughs> yeah. So the main character in the original series was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, oh, was it? Yeah, and he, like, you know, his over-the-top acting and, like, it was funny and also scary. Like, 
back in the day when that was made, like that wasn't necessarily a like contradiction. Um, like today, you can't really have like a funny, scary movie, or else you know it, you're conflicting. Their humor is like dark humor the entire time. Theirs was like we're gonna have these guys who are like super strong, have tons of like like the most manly men we could find, kind of a thing. And these, like, most masculine men they could find. And then they were like, let's give them huge guns and the ability to murder everything. And then they're going to be hunted like like dogs. And, like, it's going to be super easy for this, like, apex predator, apex predator, uh, to be able to hunt them down and take them out with ease. Um, but it takes Arnold Schwarzenegger, the main character, um, using a lot of his own, like, hunting tactics um, including like camouflage and stuff like that to uh, put up a fight against the predator. And I won't tell you anything about all that, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really good, it's a really good movie. And as it goes, they de- start to v- develop a story about like, they start to tell you a little bit more about, you know, where the predators come from, why they're here on earth. The first movie doesn't cover that at all. It was just a kind of a horror thriller um, of dealing with this idea of a, alien that comes and is trying to like murder everyone um so i i don't know it was to me it was just kind of like a it didn't need to become more movies i uh, i liked the predator for what it was originally and i think the other movies were just like people responding saying i like that too what if they'd had this what if this was a thing so like i don't think you ever have to say like oh the predator has one story i believe it could be something where the predator could kind of come off and everyone can say like Yes, we all agree that the original movie was like, that's the Predator. That's the foundation. I would love to see it be able to just be like every director or artist who decides to take on an interpretation of the Predator can then take on their own interpretation of the Predator. But I don't think that's how it's, you know, that's not how you make money in in uh, the, the movie business. So probably won't happen, especially after the last movie, which was so boring and just terrible. And oh, that was my introduction to it. So I wasn't like, now I have to go watch all the old ones. Yeah, I was just kind of like, <laughs> oh, that was a movie. Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I recommend go back and watch the first one. Um, you don't really have to watch any other ones. The first one's just really good on its own, and it's a fun ride. Really stupid. Um, yeah, I love it. One of my favorites. Uh, and then. Oh, what's what's in the, the uh, alien movies were like the the really like aliens are coming down and just trying to take over the universe. Um, of course, we could talk about Futurama forever and aliens and stuff like that and brains trying to take over the universe. But uh, what, what's your favorite? Uh, your f- top? My top. Let me pull out the list of uh, possibilities that I was debating earlier. <clears throat> Uh, well, I've said on a previous podcast, one of my favorite movies is Cloverfield. I don't think I would say that that's therefore one of my favorite alien movies. Cause like, yeah. first off, yeah, I think we established that they're aliens by like it's the aliens, second yeah. movie, but even the first movie, they kind of, yeah, but they like come out of the ocean almost at the, in the first movie. And you're kind of like curious, like, is this like something from the depths of the earth or something from. Because when, when Abrams was making that, like, the whole idea behind it was America has no good kaiju movies. Yeah. And I want to make a kaiju movie. So you almost have this, like, Godzilla feel of, like, all right, there's a monster. Did it come out of the ocean? Come from the sky? Yeah. What's going on? But if you watch the movie, the beginning of it had, like, the monster in the background was coming from the air, landing in the water. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since I've watched it. So, but, I mean, yeah, Cloverfield wouldn't be my favorite alien movie but still just yeah. one of my favorite movies i think so my favorite alien movies as of late would probably be pacific rim just because like i i just i love that i don't know i just i love that the themes that they knit together in in those movies again it's not one that you necessarily feel like you're watching a alien movie so much as like a monster movie but once you realize that there's uh, 
aliens creating beings and then sending them through a portal through the ocean <laughs> into into our planet and that you are actually facing aliens like <laughs> it's an intriguing spin upon kind of the alien narrative but i think it's just fun to watch like power rangers in real life <laughs> or real life sci-fi yeah, <laughs> scenarios yeah i don't know i just i've enjoyed both pacific rims a lot so I don't. I think that the thing that works with Pacific Rim, at least for me, was the fact that it doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, mm-hmm. Like it knows that it's a, it's just giant robots fighting giant aliens kind of movie, and they lean into that by making the action scenes really fun. So like, yep. there's a lot of development in that, and it's not like the story is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's some twists and turns here and there that really get you going. Like in the second movie, when you find out what's his face has just been overridden by the brain thing, and you're like, <gasps> you know, like, I don't, okay, fine. You're not for the corniness. I enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy, I'm not saying I don't enjoy the corniness. I saw the second one twice not, in theaters. <laughs> I'm just saying that's not the best story. That's not a rose button. No, okay, all right. But I, <laughs> I don't know. I enjoy it. Firefly, of course, is. Good oh, one. yeah. It's oh, hard yeah. to Firefly. necessarily call. Once you create stories where like you're just based in space, it's always hard to like say like alien movie because like that's just kind of like the universe, you know. But yeah. like it's got that. I think the probably one of the first like alien movies that I ever like really saw was the first scary movie I ever saw, which was Signs, <laughs> which today would not hit people as a scary movie, but in high school <laughs> When I was watching M. Night Shyamalan signs, you know, and you're just trying to figure out what on earth is going on. And at the end, you like finally for the first time see this alien like that. That was probably the first like alien ish movie in my memory. And that one was uh, that one I thought first opened me up to like thinking about this conversation a little, a little more widely. First off, because like, they do a good job. Shyamalan does a good job at painting, like, what if this happened? You know, signals are going down. You're trying to, like, figure out what's going on, but you're not really sure. And you're trying to get information, but you're struggling to get it. But then, and I I don't know if the ending aged well. I think people make fun of it now. But when you find out that the aliens, like, water is their weakness. <laughs> oh, man. Like, oh, man. To, 90% of the earth. To me. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So it was perhaps for an advanced race that can create spaceships. They didn't do their research ahead of time <laughs> to notice a the entire ocean and b the rain. But <laughs> but but <laughs> you laughed so hard you nailed your forehead on your microphone. <laughs> but I did enjoy at least the thought of like uh that made me think like, I don't know. A lot of times when you're envisioning aliens and in, in media up to that point is aliens look like us, i.e. Superman, right? Sure. He's got, yeah. he's, he's different. He's stronger and whatnot, but he, all aliens kind of look like human or humanoid in form. This one kind of had that humanoid form, but like weak to water. Why? Like, why? Like, why would something be weak to water? And then it's like, don't you need water to survive? Oh, what if what if someone on another planet didn't? What if it was actually like a weakness of theirs? And that started like getting you to think like something other than carbon-based life forms. And I remember a friend in high school was always like, you ever notice when people make aliens, like they can never create anything that like doesn't look like something we already know. Like <laughs> it's always like, bug-like or reptilian-like and it, it's usually standing on two legs with two arms or maybe throwing a few other legs but it's never like something just completely different i think the only movie in recent memory that finally tried to paint a creature that didn't look like us just creating like a monster that we've already thought of in a with what we know of the earth was uh, a rival 
Uh, did you ever see that movie with? Um, yeah, yeah, where she holds up yeah. the meme, and where she's like trying to communicate with it. And... Yeah, which is fun because this is what I love about alien movies that are actually like taking this a bit more Jamin, seriously. You're jumping way ahead. There's somebody who did that way long in the past. A what movie where they had aliens that came down that were just completely different. H.P. Mm-hmm. Lovecraft. Sir. Oh, well, I thought that was more of a spiritual realm type deal. Is that aliens? No, no, those are aliens. It's cosmic what? horror. Yeah. What? Cosmos, cosmic. Yep. He's talking about aliens coming down to Earth, and it's the color. Uh, what's the the color? Do you know in Futurama when they're like, oh, there's that color that we can't. That wow, that's brand new color that we like. Oh. Don't know how to describe. That's from H.P. Yep. Lovecraft. Um, he created an alien that was a color that we have never seen before. And uh, everything started turning that color, and it started to make everybody go crazy. And they found out that the color was living. Um, and, like, it was a organism that was trying to do something. We never know. what. That's what makes it horror is that we never know the intention of this being. Um, but we know oh. that that color had life. And that color was another living being. And that color is what uh, sent people crazy and make them, you know, horror stuff. Well, that's that's just like, I don't know. It's interesting stuff to think about. And I think that alien movies can actually speak well philosophically into, into like our current way of processing things you know when we can actually think what would another life look like would god create it and if he created it would it take on the guise of like kind of what their planet has to offer elementally and whatnot just as Mm -hmm. like our carbon-based life forms here on earth and whatnot you know obviously there's fish in the sea they look like nothing like humans in fact we would almost consider them alien they live entirely different if we tried to live like them we would die why well, they've adjusted to the habitat of a particular sphere of our planet, mm-hmm. <laughs> just as we've adapted to a particular habitat of a sphere of our planet. And they might have luck living on another planet, and we wouldn't, simply because our spheres are so radically different. We're basically living on different planets on a planet itself, you know? So, like, when people try to create new beings that really catch your attention, like an arrival, it was basically trees you know like (laughs) if i remember their spaceship is just like an oval (laughs) it's just like a big oval like it doesn't there's no jets there's nothing on it you're like wait hold up how how is someone gonna fly this thing and then the next question is how are trees flying this thing (laughs) and then you know the new questions of how would you speak with an alien? And the, it's just fun that that entire movie is actually all about language. Like, how would you write in a language to a space tree race <laughs> and try to communicate with them? Whereas a lot of early sci-fi d- didn't even, like, give a thought to language. Like, Stargate Atlantis doesn't matter where you go sorry any stargate doesn't matter where you go in any universe wherever you end up they all speak english (laughs) like that's that's just the the, way of the universe (laughs) the universal language jamin english has existed in its current form forever what are you talking about (laughs) right and they don't even try to deal with that or at least like you know, hitchhikers guys like here's a babble fish. It's the only thing we can come up with. Stick this in your ear; it'll translate on the fly. And now we actually have technology that kind of does that. And it's a little yeah. like, holy cow, we've been painting our future as we go along with this. So, yeah. I, so I'm thinking of like um, those kinds of moments of of like language and all of those things. And I start thinking about how it relates, kind of to um, I, I think this kind of the stuff you were kind of alluding to uh talking about on the jackson cloud a little bit but we talked about it before uh a little but um that kind of like communication and cloudiness like how do we communicate with these beings that we don't know how to speak to is kind of like talking to god or when other people bad people try to talk to demons and uh and that kind of stuff you know where they're trying to use a language that doesn't they're trying to use their own language to communicate with something that obviously isn't isn't communicating the same way. So like 
we, when we talk as Christians about hearing God's voice, like we're not talking about like God just literally walks up next to you and he goes, Hey, Tyler, uh, you're supposed to do this. Don't forget. And then he walked and then he just disappears. And you're like, ah, a word from the Lord. No, it's, it's like a Bless your Abraham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Hey God. Didn't know you were coming out today. Want me to make you some bread? Wash your feet? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so like most of us, though, don't get that kind of communication with God um, on, a, on a daily basis. So when we try to communicate with God, we're almost doing the same thing. We're learning a language, and we learn through like um, the prophets who have come before us that uh, the communication between God has a lot to do with listening to like – the your uh, listening to for the word of God for a specific sign, whether that be through a vision or um, something different, right? Something a little bit more um, complex, and then interpreting it through biblical understanding um, and through uh, like testing it, right? Um, testing the word that you're given, and it's kind of the same thing with aliens in like those kinds of movies. Like it's the same kind of process, right? Of like you have to sit there and go, God's like, here's a word. And then you're like, okay, okay. I see that that looks like the letter A and a W all at the same time, and I don't know how that works. Um, so then you take it, and you're like, all right, so let's start looking at what I know about, like, words and how this, how these letters work. They're, what are they trying to tell me? What are they trying to portray right now? What's this trying to say? And you you test that against the evidence that you already have, um, which the evidence that we have is the Bible. So we use the Bible to interpret God's word because it is God's word. So why not use God's word to interpret God's word? <laughs> but for a linguist, it's going to be using current language to attempt to identify a new language, which we've been doing throughout history as well as we've been interacting with different cultures. So I just find it interesting that these alien movies, even in themselves, like we're just talking about this right now, uh, cause we don't, we don't write these if anyone's thinking like, oh, they wrote this part, obviously. No, we had no idea. We honestly thought that we wouldn't be, <laughs> I was like, how are we going to find spiritual application in this? And then I, now I'm like, oh, this actually kind of makes sense. Uh, so we, we get to this point where it becomes a, a linguist is kind of taking the same steps about trying to learn a new language as we take in trying to interpret the language that God is speaking to us in, um, which isn't the language of just like God isn't speaking English to me most of the time. Usually when I try to hear God's voice, it's usually in music and like the feeling of the certain like music that'll like hit me and be like, that was God speaking to me. And I have to try to figure out what that means or a vision that comes to me. Um, and I'll be like, that was a word. I need to try to test that. What does that mean? Um, and, you know, those are usually the moments where um, how God is speaking to me is in a different language than what I, I speak. Um, so I just find it interesting that, like, even these alien movies, these ones that are so outlandishly different than a Christian faith, obviously. So, like, uh, you know, as you said in uh, in church the other day, that uh, allegory or, um, like, any, any type of comparison isn't always perfect. Um in the same case, you know, this isn't a perfect one. It doesn't fit, match up 100%. But it has a lot more overlap because in the same way, demons try to act like God when they are tempting humans throughout history, right? Hmm. And you were kind of talking about earlier, you know, you're going to be talking about this in the Jackson Cloud in more depth. So, like, we're obviously not covering that in a huge amount of depth. But we kind of talked a little bit about, and we're all nerds here, so this is all, like, you know weird stuff so feel free to you know be like this is weird it is it is for sure um and it's it's don't don't think that we're sitting here going like oh yeah, yeah this is this is the coolest thing ever i honestly think it's kind of creepy because it's um historically accurate but we're gonna get into that um you we had kind of talked before about how aliens um are kind of a mask now for demons um and i know that you have a little bit more research on that through like uh, some of Heiser's work, I think, right? Um, or other kind yeah. of work. Yeah, there's quite a few sources. Walter Martin has kind of just like, it's a huge book called The Kingdom of the Occult. And he is just a Christian, just as 
he had been doing ministry, he'd been kind of tracking a lot of different parallels and things to the occult. But when he looks at UFO cults, which there are plenty today, when he looks at UFO cults, he just shows like time after time. Look at how these aliens communicate. No one in any of these cults has ever seen an alien. They either possess a body to relate a message or they will uh, um, speak through like an impression or a vision or astral body travel and so on and so forth. You're like, These are all new age spiritual techniques. It's just demons are using like uh, – it's because they know that us in the 21st century are scientifically minded and would listen to a message of something like an alien. We, they're masquerading themselves, not even necessarily as angels of light, but in this case, like uh, just beings of light. Like we come from a more advanced sentient race than you. and We've come with real truth to offer you. So yeah, as you were saying, like as demonic parallels go with current alien understandings. They'll often um, in UFO cults and religions that believe they have literally been taught by aliens. It's never anything they've seen outside of spiritual techniques, the same kind of spiritual techniques we use to connect with the Holy spirit and have to try to understand his languages. So uh, these demonic entities are also using spiritual techniques to try to relate with uh, people as well, but the spiritual messages, just like you said, it's almost like another language. Like, yeah, that's a lot of people struggle to understand spiritual gifts in the first place because spiritual messages are just so quiet and require practice. Like if you want to learn to hear the Holy spirit, like Elijah, you're going to have to get quiet. You're going to have to understand what a gentle kind of like blowing is like that oh there's the holy spirit there's his presence it wasn't in the burning fire outside it was just this this you know like <laughs> i understand in the quiet of my heart where god is and uh it, it is uh, that's that's part of the problem with spiritual gifts for a lot of people They're like oh god never speaks to me in these ways i'm like he does you just haven't learned how to speak the language yet. You're not mm -hmm. so special that God will talk to everyone else, but just not you. <laughs> you just need, you need the practice. And that was part of the reason that I wrote that other giant book, teaching people spiritual gifts was like, this is another language we need to learn. Likewise, you could turn your understanding of that language over to false entities. If you aren't careful in your discernment and in what you're pursuing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in your grand analogy of like, here's a greater thing trying to speak to a uh, a lesser thing or something that hasn't arrived. <laughs> and now we're yeah. trying to trying to learn along the way as to how to speak that language. And and furthermore, we're learning to make sure that we're speaking that language only to connect with God and not something else. Yeah, no. Uh, and just to kind of do a quick little thing here, will we say that these uh, these demons and things are trying to lead people, and, and they're they're going to be like lost? They're kind of people are losing their way because of these demons, kind of a thing, right? Right? I'm not stretching at all to say that I'm wearing a shirt uh, that says <laughs> that. Uh, some who wander are lost, and uh, you know this 1208 bit nerd church shirt. Um, available now for <laughs> <laughs> available on uh are they still available on uh, bonfire or yeah they're still there it'll just start a new campaign if someone orders it and then it'll ship yeah. when the campaign's over so yeah if you uh want one uh get one at bonfire.com uh, and and uh, look up our our some who wander will lost shirts it helps out the ministry um and helps us greatly in uh in getting things done that you know uh, help further the, the installation of the kingdom of God here on earth right now in Jackson as it is in heaven, right? I uh, look, I'm throwing look it over. Look at All that. Right. So, uh, so trying to hit back on aliens and everything. It's just amazing to me how much overlap we can find in culture um, with like these spiritual applications that we keep like kind of pulling back to. Um, so it kind of makes me wonder even more, I guess, uh, and trying to like figure out what I'm trying to say here as well. Uh, <laughs> like how, that's, that's just so crazy to me. How can these things, like are we drawing from our past experience with these spiritual entities in some kind of a way, you know? Is it, um, 
is it something that we're we're trying to like go back to our relationship with God? Is it a mixture of like a couple of these things? You know, why why are there so many overlaps? If anyone can hear just me, it's because Tyler froze. If you can't hear just me, something else happened. Tyler. Oh. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like Tyler might be frozen. We'll have him back up in a second here. Ahem. <clears throat> In the meantime, hi, how you doing? My name's Jamin. Good to talk with you. All right, if you're watching this video, just go back to part one, which was just called Aliens or something because internet crashed. So we're, we're starting starting where we left off. Tyler, would you like to continue? You were just about to ask a question. Mm, yes, I will. Mm, mm -hmm. So I had the question of... Uh, so we just kind of been talking about language and uh, how uh, there, there's just so many like spiritual applications that we've kind of been able to put together w around culture in general, not just aliens, right? Um, so culture kind of in general has been uh, such a drawing point. That's kind of how Nerd Church began too. Um, so I had the question of, you know, where are these these spiritual applications like that we're finding? How why are there so many, do you think, in, in culture? In, in, uh, like, are we trying to reconnect with God in some way? Are we, like, is that like us kind of searching for God? I know what, this is all conjecture, Jamin. I'm not asking for an actual, <laughs> like, well thought out answer. But, like, uh, I, I'm wondering just, like, what, where are these, like, how? How are there so many things that draw us back to faith? Um, it, it just, it, like, blows my mind, you know? Yeah, and I think the answer is pretty large in scope, but I think one of the things that comes to my mind when you first ask it is that um, we kind of have like a Christian subculture, right, where yeah. we have drawn all these lines around just everything, and we have taken things that we're uncomfortable with or unfamiliar with and I've told those things that like, I, I don't like the way I feel when I hear statements like that. So I'm just going to scratch that one off and, and forget about it. Whereas the rest of the world isn't afraid to ask questions, isn't afraid to follow where um, their thoughts would lead them. And it allows them to enter into all kinds of conversations that the church is unable to enter into simply because it 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 scratches everything off the list as to like what's appropriate and that's actually it's not bad there are plenty of things that like are inappropriate to continue following and <laughs> and, <laughs> and live and do and c.s lewis talks if i i'm a hardcore paraphrasing here but i think he was talking about abraham and like how he practiced like polygamy at the time and and there's like a he, he said something like, maybe I shouldn't even say this was C.S. Lewis, but I'm pretty sure this was him. Uh, he was talking about how like some minds will get stretched just enough that even though it's like acceptable by the culture, one has to wonder if still Abraham lost something because of it, you know, like that, that he allowed to give his life over to something cultural that was not of God's will, something like polygamy. Or at least the uh, abuse of uh, Hagar as a kind of like sex slave uh, to yeah. carry out his will of having children one way or another. Um, so uh, I so I use that example to say yes, there are plenty of things in which I've seen so many Christians, especially over the last few decades, just constantly trying to broaden their mind to like. <laughs> to be willing to accept all kinds of things into their life and try to make space to say, God, I want you to make this appropriate. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the world is willing to have questions. So like aliens is one of those, like 
you ask most Christians, could God create life on other planets? Their answer is like an instant no. Like, I'm not even going to think about that. Not even going to get into that. You ask the rest of the world, it's in like every movie. Like we just said, yeah. Marvel, right? I mean, like yeah, everything has Thanos aliens. is an alien. Guardians of the Galaxy is all about it. Like, and this is all like, it's not like a bad picture we're trying to paint. It's just like a a big universe out there. Who knows? You know, and like when the church, uh, when the church finally is like, well, let me just approach that conversation. I think they're often surprised to find like, oh, you know, there's more that I can relate to and asking some God questions here than I first thought. And it's simply because I wasn't willing to to pursue the conversation any further. It's part of the reason I think the rest of the world doesn't even want to hear what we think about things is because we're often so closed minded. Yes, we should be closed minded towards things when we're like, no, that's not appropriate by God's standards, but not so closed minded that we can't have a good conversation with someone who believes that these things are okay. Cause yeah. that just saying like, Nope, you know, like someone in the world is not going to find that helpful to, to their own journey trying to figure things out they they want to rationally be convinced as to what god is doing or saying or his voice on all kinds of matters yeah no that actually is pretty enlightening because it makes me think like when i'm thinking about uh like nerd church and how we kind of function we've always kind of seen ourselves as a a, a group that I mean, we literally, you know, it, there's pushback from everything, but um, I, I think a lot of Christians are afraid to hear anything uh, called nerd church because uh, nerds are associated with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and Star Wars and all of these things that uh, the church would say, you know, is either um, one, it's it's just a waste of time in a lot of people's view because it's, uh, you know, entertainment, not something that's like bettering the world in their view, but, you know us nerds would definitely argue against that by a long shot but it kind of speaks that like nerds are surprisingly the, the the best people at kind of finding uh the 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 like the culture and 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 everything um we we just always were so invested in our entertainment and so invested in um, like talking more and learning more about things and debating, you know, uh, random ideas within culture and entertainment and all that kind of stuff um, that we, as you kind of said, we open ourselves up to um, more ideas. And I think that one thing that, you know, nerd church allows us to do is, is have a place to do that a little bit safer, right? Um, a place where we can kind of, have those conversations about weightier topics and uh, crazier topics like aliens existing um, and it not be a place where you're going to be judged, but also it's not going to be a place where we're going to allow, you know, your mind to go into like, what if these aliens had the ability to like possess you? That'd be so cool. Right guys. Like that's not what we want to do. Right. Uh, so I'm all, all that to say, like, I just think it's really cool that nerd church can, church can be a place where people can, like experiment with those uh, those ideas that we were talking about that like allow us as a church to kind of grow into a direction of asking more questions about God and like understanding more about God through like topics that wouldn't normally be considered that, you know, wouldn't have a spiritual application to them, but instead we find out they do. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's Paul's whole thing, right? Is that I become all things to all people so that I might reach a few. And uh, when we as nerds are exposed to the same entertainment, we're able to kind of like come to the forefront of knowing like the things that you care about, just like Paul would quote things from philosophers of the Greeks to reach the Greeks. Like we're mm -hmm. coming to you to quote the things that you know, to reach you. So like the guy across the street, when his mom called me, he was like, you need to come and save my son. I'm like, I, what, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> and I find myself later that day, like coming to the house, I'm like, hi, you know, and, and she brings out her son who is my age or older and has several children and a fiance. I'm like, this is who I'm supposed to just like, convince on like this isn't even like a young child who's asking questions 
this guy's not going to be into anything that I have to say. And, and like the guy's just like, Oh man, you guys, you, you believe that, you know, like, you know, God didn't make the world or that God, you don't believe in science. And you're not okay with evolution. I'm like, I personally don't have a problem with it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, what? I'm like, I love science. I just wrote a book on it and I don't have a problem believing God made the world through evolution. I think the point of the creation story was to teach us a whole lot of other important elements like God's presence, our identity, his identity, that he did make everything regardless of whatever way you want to say he made it. Um, but I don't think that it was a literal, like, it doesn't have to. He could have. He's God. I don't think that it has to be from a biblical perspective, according to my studies. And, like, you could just see his guard let down, you know, like, what, what, what? you know. And then the next thing is like, well, you know. You, you guys are, your God's the only way and all these other guys are fake. I'm like, I actually, yeah, I believe my God's the only way, but it's because he has created all things, spiritual and physical. There are in the Bible, other real little G gods. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, eight, that he created all kinds of uh, spiritual beings and put them in charge of other nations. But then it says that they've all turned against him. So we as Christians believe that we need to go and turn every back, everyone back to the one true God, because he's open to adoption. Wants you to leave the false gods behind and come to him. You know, like <laughs> he's, he's like trying to like wrap his mind around. Like, why do I have these answers for someone who, who was ready to like destroy me? Well, it's because I know these are the questions that he's asking. And I know that, he's not going to just settle for a, well, the Bible says so. Cause I did that in, in middle school. I did that where I was on a field trip and I packed my backpack with 8 million Christian CDs and I'm just like <laughs> pulling them out and listen to them all the way. And anybody want to borrow this, you know, and, and someone's like, okay, but I have some real questions about the Bible. And she asked these questions, literally every answer I gave first off, I didn't know the answers. Because no one in the church ever equipped me to give these answers. It was always just, well, the Bible says so. And so that was the answers I gave every time. Was, well, yeah, but the Bible says so. She's like, but where were the answers? I'll just like open the Bible. They're right here. You just got to look for it. You know, like these, these very unfulfilling, deep spiritual answers. And, and like, <laughs> it was a complete letdown to her. Like I had nothing to give her because I had no answers myself. It was the Homer Simpson. This, 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 book doesn't, this book doesn't have any answers. You know, that's what I looked like in that moment. It's like, I don't yeah. know. I've been a Christian my whole life. I don't know how to answer the most basic of all questions that you're asking me in this moment. You know, like, why is there a pain in the Bible? It explains it. <laughs> It's so in the Bible, I'm Why done. I like I, yeah. Uh, well, the Bible I says that kind of thing. I I don't even remember what they asked or what I said, but I knew the answer to nothing, and I had been a Christian my entire life. I'm in you know like middle school, so like ten, fifteen years of of my life have have been given to this, and yet I can't answer very basic questions. And fast forward ahead to this guy who's asking even deeper questions. I'm like, well, biblically, <laughs> and, you know, trying to understand, like, I, I know you're going to ask these questions because I know what the world wants to ask. I know what Christians want to ask. We just oftentimes want to shut the book. And aliens would be one of those questions. People want to ask it, and the church often is just like, nope, well, why not? Well, humans are the top of, of the food chain. You know, like we're the most important thing. God's not going to make other things. Like, well, we're made in his image. Spiritual beings. <laughs> yeah. Angels are made in his image. We're made in his image. Is that where the image stops? Like, you know. Right. Uh, so, so there's just, there's lots of uh, questions that the world's asking, and we can actually feed those better. And I think sci-fi, and I've said this before, but sci-fi just gives us a lot of space to expand our thinking and think a little better about things. Um, and I, I think, you know, Star Trek has been uh, talked about how it's kind of like a, a great philosophical course, makes you think outside of the box. But there's a show that built even more off of Star Trek uh, that I thought has really gone probably the most distance I've ever seen with the alien-esque sci-fi show to make us think outside the box was the Orville. 
which I, I haven't finished. I only watched like one season. I don't know how Seth MacFarlane can write ridiculous family guy stuff and then somehow create like a, a well thought out sci-fi philosophical show. <laughs> but like he just copied Star Trek. Yeah, but I think he just did it really well. So, like, we'll meet creatures on other planets where their very basic ways of life, we would say, are sin from a biblical perspective. But then the question that's being put before us is, like, so for them, these these questions are just like, is it really sin? You know, and that's where I'm like, I don't broaden my horizons like that. But the question comes before me, and we talked about this a lot in the Jackson Cloud, um, the Bible is a lot about God's order, not order as we see it, not order as Satan proposed it at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but God's order. And when we look at his order and the way in which humanity and the rest of the world has been crafted to live specifically itself, that becomes like, this is wisdom. This is righteousness. This is the way that you are to live. And then that puts me in this other place to like think about it in like an alien perspective. It's like, what if God made people on other planets and something that we humans would say is is sin in any very degree of level, but for him, like for whatever reason, for them that is order, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like that that becomes like an interesting like like way to start thinking outside the box of of alien life and how does it operate um and they push a lot of other just interesting questions and i people hate it when christianity gets targeted but i think sci-fi does a good job of like critiquing us for some of the things that we do you know they land on they go inside a spaceship and on the inside of the spaceship is a whole planet (laughs) And it's got a fake sky. It's got fake everything. The problem is the people who used to drive the spaceship have all died. And the only, all these people who live on this planet, which is not a planet, they have no idea. They don't know they're on a spaceship. <laughs> and they have all this religious stuff that they follow that was made up. It's not like, right? It's, it's evil in many ways. And and they have no idea. Their entire reality is is false from like the very perspective that there's a sky that is a hologram, you know? And like for them, what they're painting is like, is Christianity just been like completely um like it's just people lost and not paying attention to reality and, and whatnot. You know, you get these kind of vibes from it, but it also had good critique. You know, like if you're sitting back and you're like, you know what? There are times where in the Christian faith, we deny all of the reality around us simply because we have painted a fake reality that doesn't mm-hmm. even match what the Bible is trying to say. So like, this is why I love sci-fi. This is why I love uh, conversations about aliens and whatnot. It forces us to think in different capacities. I think it, strengthens our arguments and our rationale. I think it strengthens our biblical theology. Like it pushes us to think not just outside of ourselves, but outside of our planet and outside of everything. And remember that God is a creator. And even within the earth itself, life is varied. There are, I don't, I'm trying to think of what the, do we, we have animals that can, no, I don't even want to go there. I'm just going to sound stupid. <laughs> well, animals that can what? I need to know now, Jamin. We need to know. I, well, I'm thinking it's trees, right? Like, mm, I don't know. Mm, what are they doing, Jamin? We're live. Say, don't make me say stupid things. Say stupid things. It's funny. Are there things that need like male and female to like create, or is there anything oh. that can just reproduce life without that? There's there's things that can like there's a lizard that can reproduce life on its own, right? Okay. There was a story about a lizard or a snake at a zoo that had babies that was never impregnated before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how that works, but yeah, I, I don't. Like, I was reptiles, trying to think like. Good. Reptiles often have have uh, the ability to reproduce like without um, uh, a mate, like because you need usually a male and female organism. Of some sort, right? Uh, like the male and the way we figured this out was through like uh, Nelson. No, 
Oh, no, Vanilla. goodness. I was going to say something. <laughs> no, no. You know what I'm talking about, though. No, I don't. Oh, Are well, we? he's the guy. He's the he's the plant expert. Oh, my goodness. Now we both sound stupid. Now, we're, now, you, now you don't sound stupid. You let me ask the question. Ma- uh, Madonna, that's what I'm going to call him. Uh, Madonna uh, created, uh, figured out that if you, you when you take like a, a male um, piece of corn and a female piece of corn, you can make different kinds of corn based off of their like genetics. And uh, this yep. doesn't sound right at all. <laughs> this, this is science. Oh, uh, let's scratch us talking about science at all. We've been philosophical. I don't even know well, what I'm we're saying. It. I'm not a scientist, Jamin. We just talked about noticed. male and female corn giving rise to new kinds of corn. I don't... <laughs> it's real. Look it up. I'm not looking that up. <laughs> it's real. I'm going to look it and, up. It's snakes. Snakes having virgin births, which I only know because when I preached <laughs> on... When I preached on... Uh, Christmas one year, I was like, has there ever been anything ever like Mary... And sure enough, of course, it would be the snake, <laughs> which the, uh, still remains a mystery. It's the enemy of, it's the serpent. Uh, Here, to produce a better type of corn, different strains of corn are mixed or cross-pollinated. So each and every corn has both a male and female flower. The tassel sits at the very top of uh, the plant and produces the pollen. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay well um i don't even know where we're going anymore we've been talking I for know. a while you so i think we'll like get ready things, to wrap up how you you were talking about how things reproduce like on their own <laughs> uh, the, well, where are you going with trees that? i was thinking of trees i don't know where i was going with it anymore i was just thinking <laughs> of is there anything that can reproduce like by itself because if so that like shows you like something that we're already crazy used to being like a, a normal way of life, you know, like think Noah's Ark, you need two of every creature. Otherwise they gone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything on earth that already doesn't match that just to show us like just how varied life could be. Maybe mitosis. Hmm? That's something just splitting in half. <laughs> Yeah, mitosis is actually that happening. So it's asexual reproduction is what you're talking about. And it doesn't involve the fusion of gametes or a change in the number of chromosomes. There, There's the word we were looking for, chromosomes. Uh, I was looking for it. So it, <laughs> it's usually production from a unicellular or multicellular organism that inherit a full set of genes from their singular parent. Gotcha. So, yes, they do exist uh, specifically. So that's like, uh, oh no, did you freeze again? Don't leave me, Tyler. Oh no. Wait, there you are. There you are. Oh, I hear you. I'm here. Do you hear me? Oh, good. Yeah, All I hear right. you. Okay. Well, that's so good. You just finished explaining asexual reproduction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So ahead. it's Where's asexual more? reproduction. Generally, it's on the cellular, uh, like the one we know about the most is on the cellular level. However, there are plant species uh, specifically that produce, uh, you are ta- like, it's not just trees, um, but it is certain, there are certain types of trees and there are certain types of plants that can reproduce uh, asexually. Okay. So that's actually, that's kind of in my D&D campaign. So right now I'm doing a homebrew sci-fi D&D campaign. I just, I built like eight or nine races and made each one of them in a way that would make you think about like other ways in which God could create, you know, like the first race is a vineyard, they're tree people, but like they, they they're, built their entire earth into a garden. Theologically, I'm trying to get people to think of like this race never messed up at the beginning, <laughs> you know, like yeah. they, they followed God, never gave their life over to something else. And because of that, they're doing exactly what they were told to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth until the entire earth looks like the garden of Eden. And that's exactly what they're doing. My team tried to fly into that planet and a, angel appeared in their ship with a flaming sword and i don't know if they caught on what i was doing 
but it was a cherubim, like these fallen creatures trying to fly into a perfect planet. This was like the protector, like you can't come in here, not just protecting Eden, protecting the entire planet because the whole planet was Eden. You know, like that's, that's the kind of stuff that I love that sci-fi gets us to think about. I, I have another race called the Her, which nobody chose. It's just HR is how it's spelled. I wanted someone to choose it because they were my favorite race. Not my favorite. They were just the funniest of my races, I thought. They're, uh, they basically just kind of break off and create copies of themselves. So it's sort of like <laughs> asexual reproduction. reproduction. But each her has the memories of the line of the hers before them. So like there's this huge collected memories because they're all just clones but it's all yeah. within lines of like whatever they had. So you wouldn't necessarily have the same memories as this her over there because that one you didn't like break off of, you know? And so like there's a weird yeah. collective memory and not collective memory at the same time. And, and I just like, I was just trying to think the only one that I could think like, how do I make an alien that doesn't look like anything I've seen was a rental which is just a blob it has no eyes it has nothing it speaks psychically because it it has no mouth it is just a blob <laughs> <laughs> and of course amity if you know her had to be that yeah. one <laughs> so uh so the list just goes on but like each one of these was like an attempt to try to think outside the box what if there's like a space dragon race that live inside of black holes and can travel at the speed of light and, and That's this terrifying. and that. Like that. <laughs> and what if, what if Satan's big plan in this universe is to, and it's not even Satan because Satan is in the Bible, like abandoned to our planet, you know, like yeah. he's, he's not across the universe. He's actually, physically located within the spiritual realm of like our locale so so like even my satan character like can't just be satan it's got to be like another fallen angel that's tried to do something like crazy and they're going around and and stealing people from their planets and converting them into these planet eaters that they then send back to their planets and eat their planets. Why do they have to use the people of the planets to eat their planets? Well, because they've kind of like evolved from that and have this sort of like genetic overlap, you know, just like carbon based life forms and whatnot. And, and, in, and the story I'm telling, and this is just, this isn't science. This is just sci-fi, you know, like, they are the ones that have to eat their planets to actually destroy it to its core. Anyways, it's all ridiculous. But like in a D and D campaign, I'm trying to use allegory and biblical themes to try to get you to like think of these things. And if you do, I'm hoping it pushes you outside your box. Whereas if you're not noticing anything, I'm lying down. It'll just be a fun little game. You'll look back yeah. at it and not realize what's going on. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's, Anyways, awesome. that's where I'll end my thoughts. No, don't freeze again. One second, everybody. We've got some real internet issues today. Am I back? Am I back? Right. I hear you. I hear you. Am I back? All right, no, close back. us out because we have internet issues. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say before I say my words that uh, man, hey, that that's pretty great. I love sci-fi too. Uh, I definitely need to implement more of this kind of stuff into my D and D campaigns because uh, it's a lot of fun to do that. Um, so yeah, skibbly doobly doop, bop strabop, days be the dawn. See you, everybody. And with that, aliens. <laughs> Catch you all later on the cloud where we'll talk about it more. <laughs>